The year is 1951. Although campfires have warmed the frozen ground enough to dig into the decades-old mass grave, a young doctor finds what he had been looking for, the corpse of a young girl. Blue dress, red ribbons in her hair. Would this child's body hold the key to saving millions of lives? Fast forward to 2016. 20-year-old Brittany Anderson, a healthy, active young house cleaner in Milford, Iowa, felt a rasp in her throat. After taking some over-the-counter medicine, she felt better and went on with her day. When her symptoms returned the next morning, her mother Frankie took care of her like any loving parent would. A little food, off to bed, check on her regularly. It's just a cold, right? But before noon, Britt was unresponsive and had no pulse. Doctors restored her pulse and flew her to a hospital, but Britt's body had been taken over by sepsis. In sepsis, chemicals are released into the body to fight an infection such as her flu, resulting in inflammation, potentially leading to multiple organ failure. Her heart stopped beating twice within just a few minutes, and she couldn't be stabilized. Brittany Anderson had gone from perfectly healthy to dead within two days. Every year, this story plays out all over the world during the seasonal flu outbreak. And the 2019 U.S. flu season is off to an early and unusual start. The number of flu cases in the U.S. doubled in the week before this recording, and currently most cases are influenza B, which normally comes on months later in the spring. If influenza A spreads with its usual earlier timing, the combination of the two may prove very serious. In the 1918 flu pandemic, Nicknamed the Spanish Flu because of increased news coverage when it moved from France to Spain, more U.S. soldiers died of the flu than from that year's combat in World War I. An estimated one-third of the population of the world was infected, and 50 million people died. The flu killed so many people that, in the U.S. alone, the average life expectancy was lowered by over 12 years. In the small village of Brevig Mission, Alaska, 90% of the adult population died in the five days from November 15th through 20th. A hillside mass grave marked only with small white crosses remained as a grim reminder for the eight remaining adults. Permafrost, a thick subsurface layer of soil remaining frozen throughout the year, preserved the diseased corpses for decades. And in 1951, Swedish microbiologist Johan Holten excavated the grave in hopes of retrieving the virus for study. After two days of using campfires to thaw the frozen earth enough to dig, Holten recovered that little girl's body. In the end, he was able to retrieve lung tissue from four other bodies as well. During the return journey to the University of Iowa, Holton attempted to refreeze the lung tissues with a carbon dioxide fire extinguisher during the propeller-driven plane's frequent refuelings. Back in the lab, he used his mouth to attempt to draw virus into a glass pipette, a practice not considered safe by today's standards. Ultimately, his injection of infected lung tissue into chicken eggs failed to regrow the virus. His first expedition, had failed. Forty-six years later, Holton returned to Alaska to try again. He was now 72 years old, financed the expedition with about $3,200 of his own money, and took his wife's garden shears to help with the work. After about five days, he found the body of an Inuit woman seven feet below the surface. Nicknamed Lucy, she had been an obese woman, likely to have died in her mid-twenties after coming down with the flu. Her lungs had been perfectly preserved in the frigid conditions. As this was 1997, Holton was able to preserve the tissues using more advanced methods and get them into the hands of other researchers. Ten days after sending the samples, the word came back. This expedition had not failed, and Lucy's lungs had provided invaluable genetic material from the great 1918 pandemic. Of course, 1918 was far from the last flu pandemic. The 1957 pandemic resulted in another million global deaths. In 1968, another million. A less severe pandemic in 2009 resulted in a third of a million deaths in its first year. Are you getting your flu shot? If not, why not? Let's hear about it in the comments below.
Scientists urge us not to fall into the tragic belief that the problem has been solved and that we can avoid vaccination, because vaccination itself is part of what protects humanity from the most severe outcomes. In the 1918 pandemic, neither antibiotics nor flu vaccines existed at all, and much of the medical establishment was occupied due to World War I. Penicillin would not be discovered until a decade later, for example. Many improvements have been made in the following century, and annual vaccines are made available for flu strains considered to be among the most likely during the upcoming flu season. The particularly young and old are the most vulnerable, and many otherwise healthy children die each year within one to four days of catching the flu. Much, but not all, of this could be prevented if more people would be vaccinated early in the season and take care to avoid transmission to others when they get the flu. Vaccination also tends to make symptoms less severe in people who do get the flu. But alas, many people refuse vaccination. Many people don't even wash their hands after using the bathroom. Many people go to work and school while sick, spreading contagious illnesses to others. Some people are simply ignorant of the importance of vaccination, proper hygiene, and avoiding exposure of others to their illnesses. Some reject the urgency of vaccination for various reasons, including some who assert that vaccines don't work, may be harmful, or are even tools of evil government conspiracies. And some people are just stubborn. So, despite the widespread availability of vaccines and an ever-growing body of research, the flu rampages around the world every year. In the 2017 to 2018 flu season, about 80,000 people in the U.S. died as a result, and most of the 185 children who died hadn't been vaccinated. Even today, a pandemic can overwhelm the healthcare infrastructure of relatively wealthy nations, resulting in tremendous loss of life and severely impacted quality of life for survivors. During a pandemic, Doctors, nurses, and other healthcare professionals may not only be overextended due to the increased number of patients, but even be increasingly exposed to illness themselves. Vital services may become less available or unavailable, as people are too sick to work or simply dead. Ultimately, food supplies and other resources may result in famine conditions, at least in the short term. Can scientists beat the flu? Why don't more people vaccinate? If you enjoyed this topic, you may like our videos on famine, parasites, and dysentery. Some of us here have been enjoying the channels In Two Minutes and Gabin with Gavin, featured on our homepage. As always, thanks for watching Bad Discoveries.